Greetings everyone, it is I, Phoenix. Going forward, all videos will be just like this. I will be on screen talking at first so you can see my face and hear my real voice. And yeah, I'm going to be opening videos. So with that being said, sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crime Cases, Volume 12. Right after this intro and ad will play, right before the first case and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Grant Amato annihilated his family over a webcam model. Cody Amato goes missing. On January 25, 2019, Cody Amato failed to show up to his job as a nurse anesthetist at Orlando Regional Medical Center in Orlando, Florida. This was out of character for the ambitious 31-year-old medical professional who ordinarily arrived early and it caused concern among his co-workers. They contacted Cody's girlfriend who similarly couldn't reach him prompting them to ask police in nearby Chuliota to check on Amato's house where he lived with his parents and younger brother. Officers responded promptly, arriving at the sprawling property at 9.17 a.m. and entered the property to find something far more horrifying than they could have possibly imagined. What police found in the Amato home. Upon entering the home, police first found 59-year-old Chad Amato, Cody's father, laying face up on the kitchen floor with a fatal gunshot wound. Officers then discovered Cody's body on a storage room floor and 61-year-old Margaret Amato slumped over her office desk with an apparent gunshot wound to the head. Almost every member of the Amato family who lived in the home was dead. But there was one member of the family who was nowhere to be found. Cody's brother, Grant. After police officers tracked him down to a local hotel, they uncovered an absolutely bizarre sequence of events that precipitated the demise of Chad, Margaret, and Cody Amato. Who was Grant Amato? Grant Amato was the youngest son in a family of successful professionals working in the medical field. His father, Chad, was a clinical pharmacist and his mother, Margaret, worked as an operations manager overseeing medical coders. Following in their parents' footsteps, both Grant and Cody completed nursing degrees at the nearby University of Central Florida before attending nurse anesthetist programs. Cody completed the program. Grant did not. With his existing nursing degree, Grant was still able to secure a position as a nurse at Advent Health Orlando. However, in June 2018, Grant was found to have improperly administered at least eight bottles of the powerful sedative propofol to patients he believed were not being provided adequate pain management. As a result of this infraction, Grant was fired from the hospital and later arrested by Orlando police for grand larceny. Fortunately for Grant, the hospital declined to follow through on the legal process and Grant was able to avoid criminal charges. The Unraveling of Grant Amato After being fired from his nursing job and getting arrested, Grant found it impossible to secure employment in his field. This roadblock led Grant to pursue Twitch streaming, intending to play video games for a live audience who would ostensibly give him small amounts of money through tips or subscriptions to his channel. Cody and Chad supported Grant in this effort, providing their credit cards to help him purchase streaming equipment and advertising for his channel. But despite racking up charges on his father's and brother's credit cards, Grant was not thriving as a Twitch content creator. He rarely streamed and earned less than $150 each month from viewers. Instead of working, Grant slowly engrossed himself in the world of webcam models women who stream to a live audience that pays them for conversation and erotic entertainment. Grant became particularly obsessed with a Bulgarian performer who went by the online moniker, Sylvie, 
spending hours with her nearly every night in expensive private chats that cost hundreds of dollars or more per session. Over time, Grant developed a double life online where he portrayed himself to Sylvie as the wealthy professional video gamer. In order to keep up this facade, Grant showered Sylvie with money and purchased her lingerie and toys for her to model in her online shows. Enchanted by the positive reaction he received from the beautiful model when he gave her money and gifts, Grant eventually believed that he had a genuine romantic relationship with Sylvie, which only fueled his out-of-control spending and obsessive behavior. A son excommunicated. In just a few months, Grant had spent over $200,000 of his family's money on Sylvie. When Chad uncovered the massive spending and confronted his son, Grant admitted to how he had spent the money. This prompted Cody to pay for Grant to attend a $15,000 pornography addiction program at a luxury rehabilitation center. However, only a few days into the 60-day program, Grant chose to leave, later telling police that the staff informed him he did not have a genuine addiction. Upon returning home, an exasperated Chad Amato, who had committed to delaying his retirement to pay for Grant's debt, gave his son a list of rules that he had to follow if he wanted to remain in the home. One of the most important rules was that Grant was not allowed unmonitored access to the internet. He could not have a smartphone and was forbidden from contacting Sylvie. Returning home to find his fantasy world shattered took its toll on Grant, who eventually convinced his mother to allow him to use her phone to contact Sylvie. When Chad learned about this, he followed through on his threat and ordered his son to move out. Police pieced together the events. After tracking Grant Amato to a nearby Doubletree Hotel, police took him in for questioning. Strangely, Amato seemed relaxed during the interrogation, despite having his hotel room visited by a team of investigators. He never asked why he was being questioned by police. Police learned about Grant's massive debt and troubled relationship with his father. Amato expounded on these points, telling officers that his father ordered him to move out and that Cody told him, somewhat ominously, that he would take care of it. When officers confronted Grant on his involvement with his family's murder, he feigned surprise and sniffled as he stated that he hadn't murdered anyone, and he surmised that Cody must have killed his parents and then turned the weapon on his cell. This weak attempt at shifting blame to Cody was not unexpected by investigators, who had studied the crime scene and concluded that it was staged as a murder-suicide. Investigators determined that Cody's body had been turned over after his death and that his holster had been placed on the left hip, which was not the correct side for a right-handed gun odor. But, without a confession, police were compelled to release Grant until they could come up with more evidence. The Thumb Drive The most important clue that officers discovered was a thumb drive found in Grant's possession that had connected to a computer in the Amato home at 11.32 p.m. on January 24th, hours after investigators believed the murders occurred. Not surprisingly, this thumb drive stored over 500 images of Sylvie, the Bulgarian webcam model in various states of undress. Grant was arrested shortly thereafter. The prosecution would later argue that the thumb drive was a key piece of evidence, which placed Grant in the home shortly after the murders and solidified his guilt. During the trial, prosecutors called Geraldine Blay as a witness. She was the Seminole County Sheriff's Office forensic investigator who processed several electronic devices found at the Amato family's Sultan Circle house. Blaze said that seven minutes after the thumb drive was connected, Cody Amato's iPhone was also connected to Grant's computer. But the trusting process wasn't completed, which suggested that the person who connected it didn't have the password. What happened in the Amato home? 
According to prosecutors, Grant Amato was so enraged by his separation from Sylvie and his excommunication from the family home that he entered the house at around 5.30 p.m. on January 24th and shot his mother in the back of the head while she worked at her office desk. He then waited in the kitchen, and when his father entered the home, Grant shot him once behind his ear. The bullet went through the side of his head but did not kill him. Chad crawled on the kitchen floor until Grant stood over him and shot him in the head again, execution style. Grant used his murderer's father's thumbprint to unlock Chad's phone and lure Cody over via text. Cody arrived later that evening after he got off work. Grant shot him in the face as he entered the home through a storage room. He then planted the gun and holster on Cody's body to make it appear as though he had committed the murders and then taken his own life. During its opening statement, the prosecution told the jury that Grant stayed in the home with the bodies of his parents for hours before his brother arrived. The prosecution also presented DNA and gunshot residue evidence found on Grant's gloves and cuffs, saying there was, quote, a one in seven hundred billion chance it being someone else's. Despite all of the evidence stacked against him, Gran Amato maintained his innocence, pleading not guilty to three counts of premeditated first-degree murder. His defense pointed to the lack of compelling DNA evidence and accused investigators of having tunnel vision and allowing their belief that Grant was guilty to paint their interpretation of the crime scene. But jurors weren't swayed, and on August 12, 2020, Gran Amato was found guilty on all three counts and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole on each count. Where are they now? Grant Amato is serving his sentence at the Okeechobee Correctional Institution in Florida. About two hours north of where Grant is sitting in prison, his brother and parents are buried at the Chuliota Cemetery in Seminole County, Florida. It's been stated online that Sylvie, real name Sylvia Venceslavova, continues to work as a cam girl. It's difficult to verify this, but a fan page Instagram account that appears to be Sylvie's remains active, although it hasn't had any new posts since 2019. An addict who wouldn't let his world collapse. Grant Amato became addicted to his own fabricated online fantasy life, a world where he wasn't an unemployed, perpetually single 30-year-old man who still relied on his parents to pay his bills. But when his father Chad grew tired of cleaning up Grant's mess of a life and told his delusional adult son no, Grant snapped and resorted to the most extreme possible reaction. His malignant behavior was consistent with how narcissists often respond to forced intervention. Recorded interviews and other court documents showed Grant spiraling into depression after being cut off from Sylvie. He wrote, quote, I am unable to function normally without her, and I will never get over her. Amato's mother and brother evidently called 911 a month before the murders because Grant was depressed, possibly suicidal. The state attorney later released emails showing that during the discovery phase of the trial, prosecutors found a strange clue. The hint word for Amato's email password was Shinigami, which means God or spirit of death that invites humans to their death. Given that Grant never admitted to the murders, we may never know the full picture of what was happening inside his mind prior to annihilating his family. But his case serves as an extreme example of the lengths some addicts are willing to go to get their next fix. It also highlights the importance of identifying and aggressively treating addiction to prevent severe acts of theft and violence. To this day, Grant Amato maintains his innocence when asked at his sentencing whether he felt remorse for his actions, he told the court, quote, My family has been blaming me for months for ruining their lives, stealing, and not following the rules of the home, so I might as well be blamed for this too. Prior to his conviction for the execution-style murders, he wrote to reporters asking to sell 
the exclusive rights to a story in exchange for financial help, such as a millionaire who could pay his bond. I just want to feel the sun again, feel the breeze on my skin, feel the simple pleasures every innocent man feels. He also wrote that memories of his past, quote, remind me of the family that was taken from me and the brother I love more than anything in this world. The Murder of Chelsea Brock, Halloween Party Horror. Chelsea Brock's Last October. Saturday, October 25th, 2014, was a beautiful autumn day in Frenchtown Township, Michigan. The air was crisp. The sky was brilliant blue with temperatures hovering in the low 70s. It was perfect weather for the popular Halloween party set for that evening. Michael Williams, known to the locals as Big Mike, hosted an annual Halloween bash at his mother's farm located at Post and Williams Road in Frenchtown Township. Attendance numbers were huge. Somewhere between 600 to 1,000 people showed up every year. It was considered the Halloween event in the area. Big Mike's Halloween Party One of the people looking forward to the big Halloween bash was 22-year-old Chelsea Brooke. Chelsea was a 5'7", beautiful, blonde-haired woman who was the youngest of five children. A waitress at the local restaurant, Olga's Kitchen, Chelsea planned to attend Monroe Community College to earn a degree in culinary arts. She had been working on her Halloween costume for weeks and was excited to dress up as Poison Ivy, the character made famous by Uma Thurman in the 1997 movie Batman and Robin. Chelsea wore a long red wig, red lipstick, a green leaf top, and black yoga pants. She carried a bottle of wine labeled Poison. She arrived at the party that night with her good friend Rebecca Brinson. The weather was perfect, just like the crisp fall evenings in Halloween horror movies. The air smelled of bonfires and the red, orange, and gold leaves swirled and floated in the gentle breeze. There was drinking and music and fun. Pictures of Chelsea and her friends that evening show them smiling and having a great time. Chelsea disappears into the night. The party went on for hours. As the night drew to a close, the crowds began to thin out. At 2.30 a.m., Chelsea's phone rang. She didn't recognize the number, but she answered. The caller offered her a ride home. She accepted. With leaves crunching under her feet and the soft autumn breeze flowing around her, Chelsea disappeared into the darkness. She had no idea what awaited her. The Search Chelsea never made it home from the party. The next day, her family called the police and immediately began searching. A friend told police investigators that Chelsea received an unknown call at 2.30 a.m. on the night of the party. Another friend said that Chelsea left the party around the same time with a man named Daniel Clay, but that's all anyone knew. A large search party was organized. Volunteers scoured the expensive rural area where the party had been held. When they found nothing, they fanned out to an even larger area. Within two days, authorities coordinated a massive search operation with hundreds of volunteers and extensive media coverage. However, no clues were ever found. The police interviewed many of the partygoers, as well as the host of the party, but no one had any relevant information. A long winter with no answers. The crisp fall weather turned cold and winter marched in. Still, there were no signs of Chelsea. Her mother, Leanda Brock, converted a closed Monroe Bank and Trust Newport branch into the Fine Chelsea headquarters, a search command center. Together with the other local mothers of missing or murdered women, such as Debbie Kemen and Kimberly Turnquist, the Brock family organized a purple ribbon campaign. With the help of friends, family, and community supporters, 
Leandra distributed hundreds of thousands of flyers bearing Chelsea's photo. There were flyers on power poles, windows, front desks, and bulletin boards. They were taped to pizza boxes and floral deliveries. The flyers went out all around Michigan and Ohio, as well as other states across the country. Worldwide, an estimated one million flyers were shipped. No one came forward with information, but Chelsea's mother would not give up. A heartbreaking discovery. Spring arrived and police still had nothing. Then, in early April 2015, there was a break in the case. Chelsea's poison ivy costume and some other pieces of her clothing were found at an abandoned industrial site formerly called Specialty Petroleum on Peters Road near Van Horn Road in Flat Rock, about 10 miles away from where Chelsea was last seen leaving the Halloween party. Then, on April 24, 2015, the family's worst fears were realized. Chelsea's naked body was found by a construction crew in a shallow grave at a rural construction site near a set of railroad tracks in Ash Township. The arrest of Daniel Clay. <laughs> Within a year of Chelsea Brooks' disappearance and death, a massive investigation generated a thousand tips from the public. Sheriff's detectives conducted 800 interviews and issued 34 search warrants and 14 subpoenas. 50 different law enforcement agencies assisted the effort, and it paid off. On July 22, 2016, the Monroe County Sheriff's Department arrested 27-year-old Daniel Clay at the Frenchtown Villa Mobile Home Park. Major Jeff Kemp announced to the media, We got him. Forensic evidence linked Clay, who was seen leaving the party at the same time as Chelsea, to her murder. His DNA, which was collected during an unrelated robbery, matched the sample that was found on Chelsea's poison ivy costume. The killer's confession. During his interviews with detectives, Clay, who had a long criminal history, gave several conflicting accounts. First, he said he gave Chelsea a ride and pulled over to the side of the road where they had rough consensual intercourse. He told police Chelsea asked him to slap and choke her. He claimed that he killed her by accident and tried unsuccessfully to revive her using CPR. Instead of taking Chelsea to a hospital, he drove around for about 40 minutes and then dumped her body in a heavily wooded area. Clay's girlfriend, Kelly Richer, told the Free Press that he confessed to the murderer in a phone call the next day. Jessica Preble, the mother of Clay's child, would later testify that on the day of the arrest, Clay left her a voicemail in which he said he was, quote, extremely sorry that he fucked up big time and was going to be gone for a really long time. Clay was arraigned on July 25th and requested no bond. Two weeks later, he was arraigned on additional charges for first-degree home invasion and first-degree criminal sexual conduct from a separate incident involving the assault of a woman. Trial and Verdict The medical examiner confirmed that Chelsea died from blunt force trauma to the head. She had multiple fractures on her face, neck, jaw, and teeth. The medical examiner said she was 99.99% sure Chelsea did not die from being choked. Clay was originally charged with second-degree murder, but this was eventually amended to open murder, which allowed the jury to consider a first-degree premeditated murder charge carrying a mandatory life sentence. The prosecution was a long, drawn-out process that lasted almost two years. Monroe County Sheriff Detective Brian Sroka testified during the trial that, quote, Clay pulled up next to Chelsea, asked if she wanted a ride. She said she did. She got in the vehicle. Clay stated that they drove down the road a little bit, and they proceeded to have sexual relations there. After he killed her, according to Sroka, Clay panicked and disposed of her body. No accident. 
During closing arguments, Michael Rorig of the Monroe County Prosecutor's Office dismissed the contention that Chelsea's death was an accident. Quote, a fair examination of the facts of the evidence proves the defendant murdered Chelsea, not by some erotic asphyxia, but by multiple blunt force traumas to her face. Defense attorney Russell Smith countered that it was not Clay's intention to kill Chelsea, arguing that, despite his history of sexual violence, he had no motive. But Rorick pointed out that Clay, not taking Chelsea to receive medical help, showed his consciousness of guilt. Ultimately, the prosecution said three elements proved Chelsea Brooks' death was not an accident. Blunt force trauma to her face, blood on the inside of her costume, and the torn straps and crotch. The jury agreed. In July of 2017, Clay was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. According to his prisoner page on the Michigan Department of Corrections website, he is currently serving his time at the Ernest C. Brooks Correctional Facility in Muskegon Heights, Michigan. Forgiveness Amid Devastation Chelsea's murder affected all of Monroe County, especially the close-knit community of Frenchtown Township, for whom Halloween would never be the same. The Brook family was devastated, but Chelsea's mother, Leanda, stated in court that she had forgiven Clay and even given him a gift. Quote, I am leaving you with the Bible. Jesus came to heal our mess of a life, and I hope you will let him in to help. Heal your mess, said Brock. The Murders of Jennifer and Abby Blagg, A Perfect Family's Dark Side. What happened to Jennifer and Abby Blagg? The shocking death of 34-year-old Jennifer Blagg and her six-year-old daughter Abby in Grand Junction, Colorado, captivated and horrified the country for years. What began as an ordinary day in 2001 turned into a nightmare when Michael Blagg reported that his wife Jennifer and daughter Abby were missing. As the investigation unfolded, the truth eventually revealed a chilling tale of deceit, betrayal, and murder. We will delve into the heart-wrenching details of the case, the trials, and the impact this tragedy has had on the family and the community. The Blagg Family According to friends and family, Jennifer Blagg was a very sweet woman who called her mom every day and started her Christmas shopping in early November. Jennifer was devoted to her Christian faith and prioritized finding that quality in a husband. While studying business at National University in San Diego, she met 25-year-old Michael Blagg, a helicopter pilot in the U.S. Navy, who seemed to fit the profile. Her friend Teresa Wiedemann said, quote, Jennifer was always looking for a great family man, a great Christian man, and for him to be the provider and have kids. Life in Simpsonville Jennifer and Michael married in 1991. Soon after, Michael retired from the Navy and became an engineer. The newlyweds moved to Simpsonville, South Carolina, where they started their family with the birth of Abby. According to Michael, Abby became a miniature Jennifer, who would wake up singing in the morning and go to bed singing at night. Simpsonville was the perfect community for Jennifer and Michael, who both taught Bible study classes and made wonderful new friends at their church. Jennifer volunteered with Abby's first grade class and took up jazzercise. Life was good. But behind the scenes, a darker dynamic was playing out. Michael was protective of Jennifer, behavior which friends said would become overbearing at times. Another of Jennifer's friends, Eddie Melson, said some of her reactions were concerning. Quote, you could just see the absolute panic on her face. All she could think about was getting things set so Michael could have a good environment when he came home. 
In 2001, the Black family moved to a quiet cul-de-sac in Grand Junction, Colorado, for a new job Michael had accepted. Jennifer didn't want to leave Simpsonville and was unhappy with the change, but she wanted to be supportive. The Disappearance On November 13, 2001, Michael Black tried calling home three times on his way back home from work. In a recording from one of the calls, Michael can be heard saying, quote, Hello, my beautiful bride. Hope you're having fun. You're out and about doing all kinds of cool and nifty things. He later told police that he became worried and felt that something was wrong. When Michael got home, he noticed the back door was open. Inside the home, he found something much more concerning, which he described in a call to the Mesa County Sheriff's Office. Quote, I can see there was a large dark spot on the bed. I think that maybe she wrote off the bed and is on the ground on the other side. And so I go to the other side of the bed and there's more blood. Michael reported his wife and daughter missing. Authorities arrived at the family home and found no sign of forced entry. Jennifer's purse, keys, and car were still at the house and Abby's backpack was found in her room. Investigators focused on the blood-soaked mattress in the master bedroom and the large blood stain on the floor beneath it. This discovery marked the beginning of a case that would leave the small community of Grand Junction shaken to its very core. The Investigation At the start, authorities treated the case as a missing persons investigation. But a large amount of blood found at the scene and the lack of any lead suggesting that Jennifer and Abby left voluntarily convinced detectives that they were dealing with a homicide. Investigator Steve King said the crime scene left him scratching his head because nothing about it looked right. There was a large amount of blood. Jennifer and Abby were gone, and yet there was no sign of a struggle. On the carpet near the bed, Investigators also recovered Jennifer's empty jewelry box. Quote, You're struck by the fact that there was all sorts of other things there that someone that is in there purely for monetary gain would have taken with them, said King. So I'm saying, you know this crime scene doesn't look right. It looks like it was staged. Anomalies and Suspicions over the next few months, law enforcement authorities conducted searches of the area, interviewed friends and family members, and investigated the Blagg's personal lives. This included interviewing Michael Blagg about any tensions in his marriage. Michael said that he and Jennifer loved each other and their marriage was fine, but he struck investigators as eerily calm and composed for a person whose wife and daughter were missing. Detectives learned that Michael and Jennifer's marriage was far from perfect. The couple had been struggling financially and attending marriage counseling. Friends reported that Jennifer confided in them about the fear of her husband's anger. Despite these red flags, Michael denied any involvement in the disappearance of his wife and daughter. Investigators were baffled enough by the crime scene already, but when DNA results from the blood evidence came back, they were even more confused. The tests confirmed the blood was Jennifer's, but there were no additional traces of it found in the house. The only other location where her blood was found was in the family van parked in their garage. Horrific discovery and arrest. In June 2002, Mesa County authorities got a crucial tip from a coworker of Michael's who remembered that on the day of his wife's disappearance, the engineer had taken out the trash at work, which was not one of his usual job duties. The police used global positioning technology and landfill logs to identify the local landfill where Michael's employer, Amtec, dumped its trash. Jennifer Blagg, found in landfill. Seven months into the search for Jennifer and Abby, during one of the hottest summers in recent Mesa County history, police made a shocking discovery. After 16 days of combing through the garbage in 100 degree temperatures, they found something horrifying. In what was described as a surreal scene, 
Authorities witnessed a leg falling out of a red and black plastic tent that was surrounded by garbage. Mesa County Coroner Dr. Dean Havlick showed up at the scene and confirmed that the unrecognizable remains were that of a decomposing human. Eventually, he identified the appendage and body as belonging to Jennifer Blagg. Havlick would later testify in court that Jennifer had been shot in the head, specifically her left eye, and her body had been wrapped in a tent before being discarded. He said that a gunpowder tattoo on her face proved she had been shot at a close range. Authorities could not locate Abby's remains, but they had enough to arrest Michael Black for the murder of his wife. Two days after the landfill discovery, they arrested Black at his mother's home in Georgia. The Prosecution of Michael Black. Michael Black continued to maintain his innocence and even attempted to slit his own wrists, leaving behind a suicide note proclaiming his love for his family. Though Michael had the support of his mother, sister, and public defender David Esner, the tide of public sentiment turned when lurid details of his cybersex activities surfaced, as well as evidence that Michael and Jennifer had been fighting prior to her disappearance. When asked what he thought happened to his wife and daughter, Michael said, quote, At some point, while we were out as a family, somebody saw us and decided that they liked Abby and wanted to take her. After I had left, they broke in through the back, shot Jennifer, grabbed Abby, and why they took Jennifer at that point, I don't know. Unless it somehow was to control Abby. Black's first trial took place in 2004 and was fraught with tension and emotional testimony from friends and family members. Prosecutors painted a picture of a man who was unhappy in his marriage and killed his wife in a fit of rage. The defense claimed there was no physical evidence linking Michael to the crime and suggested that an intruder or child predator was responsible for the murder. The jury found Michael Black guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Conviction thrown out. However, after a decade in prison, Black's conviction was tossed when the defense presented evidence that a juror had been dishonest on a questionnaire about domestic violence, which the defense argued could have influenced her decision-making process during the trial. The district judge agreed and a new trial was ordered. 21st Judicial District Attorney Pete Halsinger called the retrial a 10,000-pound gorilla dropped on his staff. Colorado Public Defender Doug Wilson stated, quote, Everybody has to start over. Because it was so long ago, it's almost like taking a case from the start. Second Trial and Aftermath The five-week retrial took place in a new venue, Jefferson County, in 2018. While much of the same evidence and arguments were made by both sides, there were some dramatic surprises. At the end of the prosecution's case, jurors were briefly shown graphic autopsy photos of Jennifer Black's body. Prosecutors presented a timeline showing that Michael Black shot his wife in the face while she was sleeping, wrapped her body in a tent, and discarded it in the dumpster at his office. He transported the body in the family van which, they argued, explained why traces of Jennifer's blood was found inside. Lisa Norcross, who became the lead investigator on the case in 2005, testified that there were scuff marks found on the fence in the backyard of the Black home and tire marks on the road next door. Unlike his first trial, Michael Black took the stand in his defense, delivering unemotional testimony that he loved his wife Jennifer with all of his heart and had nothing to do with her disappearance. The defense characterized the evidence against Michael as circumstantial. They also presented a new theory of the murder, arguing that a serial killer and child predator, identified in court documents only as Mr. B, was Jennifer and Abby's real murderer. However, the jury didn't buy this narrative. 
After 17 long hours of deliberation, they returned a verdict of guilty on the charge of first-degree murder. Michael Black was once again sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The conviction brought some closure to the family and community. However, the question of what happened to Abby still haunts those who followed the case closely. Impact The tragic deaths of Jennifer and Abby Black left a deep impact on the family, friends, and community of Grant Junction. The case served as a chilling reminder of the darkness that can exist within the lives of a seemingly happy, church-going family. Jennifer's mother, Marilyn Conway, became an advocate for missing and murdered children. The case also triggered widespread discussions about domestic violence, the challenges faced by law enforcement in these cases, and the importance of supporting victims and their families. Despite being convicted of murder twice, Michael Black still maintains his innocence, as does his family. His sister, Claire Peterson, said, quote, Our brother, Michael Black, is innocent, and we will not give up the fight until he's found not guilty and we can bring him home. Bethany Decker the girl whose body was never found. Who was Bethany Ann Decker? Bethany Littlejohn Decker was a 21-year-old university student who lived in Ashburn, Virginia. She had two younger siblings. She was described as always upbeat and smiling. She was studying global and economic change at George Mason University. During her time at GMU, she got pregnant by Army National Guardsman Emily Decker. They married in 2009, and six months after the couple's wedding, their son was born. Emily was often deployed to Afghanistan with his unit for months at a time. During those times, the baby was frequently left with Bethany's in-laws in Columbia, Maryland, so that she could work and attend classes. Extramarital Affair Bethany started a part-time job in a restaurant for extra income. Emily was soon to leave for Afghanistan for a long period, and this was a difficult time for Bethany. At this point, the couple decided to take a break. Bethany met a Bolivian immigrant named Ronald Rolden in the restaurant and started a romantic relationship with him. She told her mother that she was feeling very lonely because Emily was overseas for such a long time. Bethany's best friend Sarah was shocked when she discovered that Ralden had moved into Bethany's apartment. Sarah tried to warn her friend about the consequences of taking such a drastic step, but Bethany didn't listen. Communication between Emily and Bethany was waning, and Emily noticed that something was going on. Emily tried to communicate with Bethany, but she was unsuccessful. Abusive Relationship Things started changing between Bethany and Renald. Renald became a controlling and abusive partner. Bethany's mother, Kim, was scared for her daughter after hearing about what was going on in Bethany's life. She suspected that Renald had hurt Bethany's son, Kai, which is why the boy was scared of Renald and had a black eye on one occasion. Renald also tried to approach the daycare where Kim was and pretend that he was Emily. Fortunately, the daycare staff realized that something was wrong and nothing bad happened. Renald started calling and texting Bethany even when she was at work, asking where she was and who she was with. She was pregnant again, and this time the father was Renald. Bethany was in a very bad situation and decided to tell everything to Emily. Bethany told Emily that she had made a mistake. Emily was a devoted father and tried to make things better. They spent the holidays together in Hawaii. Bethany wanted to kick Renald out of the apartment or leave the apartment herself secretly. She and her mother began developing a plan to get her out of that relationship. Bethany goes missing. 
On January 28, 2011, Bethany and Emily came back from vacation and spent the night at her grandparents' home. Bethany confided to her grandmother that she was drowning in stress and guilt. She said that she had made a mistake by leaving Emily and choosing Renald. The next morning, Emily saw Bethany before she returned to her Ashburn apartment. Later that day, Ralden claimed to have seen her there, but she has not been seen since. The last time Bethany spoke to anyone besides Emily or Ralden was when she called her workplace to check her work schedule for the upcoming week. On February 2nd, Emily arrived at the airport hoping to see Bethany there, but she didn't come. He called Bethany and she didn't respond. Emily also called her restaurant, but they said she hadn't been at work for the last few days. He called her family and said something was wrong. Bethany's friend Sarah logged into her Facebook account and saw Bethany was online. Sarah immediately sent her messages via messenger, but the replies were misspelled and the English was broken. Sarah knew it was not Bethany. Emily also got an email in poor English from Bethany's email address. Bethany's account had been hacked. Decker's grandmother visited her apartment, but no one was there. On February 19th, her mother called 911 to report Bethany missing. Investigation. Authorities moved quickly because they had already lost so much time. According to investigators, Bethany had not used her bank accounts or phone since the day she was last seen, nor had she reported to work or attended her class. Police focused on Emily and Ralden since both might have had a motive to hurt Bethany due to their love triangle. With the help of the Army's Criminal Investigation Division, they were able to contact Emily and get him back to the United States, where he took a polygraph test. Ralden left Bethany's apartment and started living with his mother in Centerville. When he was asked about Bethany being missing, he informed investigators that he thought he had returned to live with her family. Renald was the last person who saw Bethany alive. He became a person of interest to the police, but there was nothing that could link him to Bethany's case. A search warrant was issued for Renald's apartment, and his phone, computer, and hard drives were all seized, but the search yielded nothing. Months turned into years, and no trace of Bethany could be found. Bethany called me the night before she was killed and said, Mom, I love you. As that was the last thing she said to me, I simply want to urge everyone to make sure they talk to their loved ones and not take tomorrow for granted. Bethany's mother's statement to the media. Strange 911 call. In November of 2014, a woman named Vicki Willoughby called 911 and said she had shot her boyfriend twice when he attacked her. Her boyfriend? Renald Ralden. Vicki drew a revolver that she had hidden in the living room. Ralden continued to struggle, but she was able to shoot him twice. Eventually, he took control of the gun and shot Vicki three times, once in the head, causing her to lose an eye. Because detectives thought she had been acting in self-defense, she was not charged. As the inquiry continued, Ralden moved to North Carolina, and there, in 2016, he was found guilty of criminal assault with the intent to kill his new girlfriend and received a six-year prison term. Vicki appeared on an episode of the Dr. Phil TV show devoted to the Decker case. Vicky said that Rolden told her during their fight that he could make people disappear. The Loudoun County Sheriff's Office acquired a warrant for Rolden's arrest for Bethany's kidnapping on November 9, 2020. After serving his sentence in North Carolina, LCSO brought him back to Loudoun County. In connection with Decker's disappearance, Rolden pleaded guilty to second-degree murder on November 17, 2022. Confession. Ralden agreed to meet with the county prosecutors and investigators to explain what happened as part of a plea deal. Ralden claims that he got into a fight with Bethany about her returning to work for another shift. 
Her head hit a windowsill when he pushed her in the back. She fell to the ground, unresponsive. He claimed that she wasn't breathing. Instead of dialing 911 or attempting to revive her, Ralden threw her body in the nearby trash compactor after wrapping it in a large plastic bag provided by their Ashburn apartment community for the disposal of Christmas trees. The Verdict Ralden received the maximum penalty of 40 years in jail, with the exception of 12 years and 6 months. If Ralden violates any other terms, such as being prohibited from contacting Decker's family members, or commits another crime while his sentence is suspended for 25 years, he would be forced to serve the entire term. Quick Facts Bethany's in-laws were unaware of the couple's marital difficulties. Evelyn Bayless, Decker's grandmother, claimed that Rolden was extremely domineering and had threatened Decker and her family. Bethany's brother and sister said they'd been diagnosed with PTSD following the loss of their older sister. Bethany played an important role in raising them because their mother was a cardiac nurse who worked long hours. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these True Crime Cases, Volume 12. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.